Hi everyone, this is Sarah from Hamilton. This video is one of 17 sessions from my course, Answering Protestantism from the Bible. In this course, I attempt to demonstrate systematically and exegetically that scripture, taken on its own terms, even without explicit appeal to tradition, undermines the substance of the Protestant critique of Orthodox and, to some degree, Catholic practices and doctrines, such as the veneration of saints, the veneration of Mary, the intercession of saints, the visibility of the Church, justification by theosis, and many other issues. If you're interested in signing up for this course, please see the pinned comment, and when you sign up for the course, I will send you an email with a link to all of the lectures. Enjoy. Okay, so uh, welcome to uh, session two of answering Protestantism from the Bible. Uh, today, what I want to do is to look at uh, some themes and strategies uh, in approaching the Bible uh, in itself. So just not setting aside, but um, broader than the whole issue of tackling Protestantism specifically, uh, how is it that we should and can look at the Bible and how is it that we uh, approach it in a manageable way? Uh, so before getting into that, uh, we'll start with a prayer. Illumine our hearts, O Master, who lovest mankind, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge. Open the eyes of our mind to the understanding of thy gospel teachings. Implant also in us the fear of thy blessed commandments, that trampling down our carnal desires, we may enter upon a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as are well-pleasing unto thee. Thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God. Unto thee do we ascribe glory. <clears throat> together with thy Father, who is everlasting, and thine all holy good and life-creating spirit, both now and ever, to the ages of ages. Amen. Um, so let me share the screen for the slideshow. Uh, by the way, if, if at any point, I don't know what it sounds like on your end, but if at any point the dog snoring becomes just prohibitively loud, please someone just let me know so I can put him somewhere else. I don't know exactly what it sounds like through the microphone. So just uh, hit the raise hand button um, and I should be able to see that. Okay, uh, okay. so um, what is it that should shape our response to Protestantism? In the last, uh, oh, and I meant to say, sorry. Um, so the Dropbox with all of the recordings uploaded after we do the class, that will be available tomorrow. And I'll send out an email with a link to everybody with the Dropbox. So if you haven't seen the last class um, that was recorded uh, and it will be uploaded by tomorrow evening. So I just wanted to say that because I've received a couple of emails about that. OK, so in the last um, discussion, we talked about the shape of the Protestant critique of Orthodox theology. Uh, Yes, the slides will be in the Dropbox. Um, it'll be just all of the, the whole recording. Um, uh, and we looked at the shape of the Protestant critique of Orthodox theology. And what I suggested to you is that the general Protestant critique is not so much an argument about a specific theological issue like justification or the veneration of saints or something like that. That's usually the verbal form in which an argument against orthodoxy will take. But I think that these specific arguments are really drawn from a deeper and more intuitive perception that the contours of orthodox theology are fundamentally unrelated to the contours of biblical theology. That is the things that orthodoxy tends to care about and focus on are not the things that the Bible really cares about and focuses on. At best, I think the general Protestant intuition is, uh, the Orthodox um, interpretation of Christian theology uh, really focuses on things which might be there in the Bible, but which are relatively marginal, whereas Orthodoxy ends up marginalizing things which are perceived to be central themes in the biblical stories, like justification by faith or something along those lines. Uh, so in tackling the Protestant critique of Orthodox theology, I think that what we need to really start with is looking at the overarching story arc of scripture. That is, what does the Bible really care about? What's the kind of story that it's telling? We talk about it being a story of the redemption of the world and the consummation of creation, but what does that actually mean? What is God buying the world back 
for. When you purchase something, you're purchasing it to do something with it. So what is it that God wants to do with creation? And what does that have to do with the things that we perceive to be central in Orthodox theology? Um, and my argument uh, is that the central theme in the Bible is the theme of divine indwelling. This from beginning to end is the major story of scripture. Scripture begins with uh, the creation of the world and the creation of the world is as is widely discussed by a whole variety of people from various Christian traditions these days. Uh, the creation of the world is described in terms of it being a sanctuary where God is going to dwell and human beings have a specific liturgical role to play in the context of that sanctuary. And so God shapes out and separates the things of the world and puts them together in new ways. And at the end, he installs his image in the world. And that image has a particular function in the, uh, in, in the wiring of creation as a whole, and so on and so forth. And then you have the, guard, the planting of the Garden of Eden, where God is walking in the midst of Adam and Eve. God has a relationship with Adam and Eve. This relationship is one where they're able to speak with him and dwell with him and converse with him. And when they're expelled from that, they are cut off from the divine presence. This is a phrase that is repeated throughout the book of Genesis, that being driven away from the presence of the Lord. And the prophets will allude to this phrase, being cut off or driven away from the presence of the Lord. And you see throughout the story of the antediluvian world that mankind grows further and further away, both spiritually and geographically speaking, from the place of God's indwelling. And ultimately, that entire world gets washed away. And when the world is uh, set up again, there isn't a central sanctuary anymore. Well, the whole narrative arc from Genesis to Exodus is about the restoration of that sanctuary, so that by the end of the book of Exodus, God is again dwelling with mankind. But God's dwelling with mankind in Exodus presents all sorts of issues which require the installation of a series of veils which separate mankind from the divine presence for mankind's own sake. It's dangerous to be in the presence of God when you're in a particular kind of spiritual state. The whole book of Leviticus is about facilitating access to God's glory. It's about remedying the problem that emerges from the reality that Israel is a descendant of Adam. And Adam had created the spiritual state for the human family. And yet God still intends to dwell and live with the human family. And that story is the story which works through the whole Old Testament and leads into the incarnation of the word. Um, the Old Testament in its uh, 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 Hebrew order ends with the book of Chronicles. And the book of Chronicles ends with this injunction to go up and build the house of the Lord. In fact, when King Cyrus invites Israel to go up, he uses a phrase about God being with the person who will go up. And that phrase most closely resembles a phrase that was last used of the Davidic covenant, where God desires to build David a house when David desires to build God a house. So it is messianic in nature. And also the phrase, let him go up, is a quotation from the end of the book of Genesis, where Joseph is prophesying Israel's going up from the land of Egypt. And in fact, that phrase, go up, is associated with resurrection throughout uh, the whole Bible. And so it's interesting the way in which the Bible as a whole, or the Old Testament as a whole, is structured according to this expectation that through the agency of the Messianic King, the divine presence will be restored to the earth, and mankind will be able to access that divine presence in a way that is uh, as or more intimate than uh, existed in the Garden of Eden. This is the major story of the Bible, the interrelation of human beings as the image and likeness of God so that human beings can live and dwell in God's presence. So it's the theme of divine indwelling. Now, of course, we have to give that some more specificity and shape as to in cashing out what this means in terms of theosis or divinization. But what I want to do here is just give you kind of a sense of what I think the broad contours of scripture really are all about. Because when you see things in those terms, then the language of justification and sanctification 
and all of those kinds of things, you see them in a new light. You relate them to the temple. You relate them to the personal, visible revelation of God's presence in such a way that it doesn't destroy mankind. And this is really what theosis or divinization is all about. Theosis is about being made a participant in God's life by being made a sharer in the life of his only begotten son, or in other words, it's about being brought into God's family. So now think about what the temple fundamentally is, or what the tabernacle fundamentally is, what any of these sanctuaries are, is they are constructed as a house for God to dwell as the father of Israel. It is consistently linked with his fatherhood in relation to Israel. Now, if you want to live in the same house as God or as anybody, you have to be a member of their family. And that interrelationship indicates a certain union or joining and likeness. And the way in which you can cash that relationship out is in terms of marriage. You know, if you uh, aren't a member of someone's family, but you want to be joined into their family, you could be married to them. Now Israel is married to God so they can live in the same house as God, or you could be adopted. You're adopted into uh, sonship. And both of these themes are underscore and undergird what we're talking about when we're talking about theosis in biblical terms. Now, I think that all of our orthodox distinctives, and in many cases, this is the same with respect to Catholicism, really follow out from this fundamental point. For orthodoxy, the essence of salvation or glorification is being made a participant in the life of God through the incarnation. So classically, God became man so that man can become gods. Or in uh, a quotation from the New Testament, St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, 9, he who was rich became poor for our sake so that we, by his poverty, might become rich. And if you just look at the way in which Paul uses the language of wealth and riches, well, he uses a phrase, riches of his glory, repeatedly throughout his epistles. So being made rich through the poverty of Christ is directly connected to being made a participant or a sharer in the glory of God, which gives immortality. So if this is at the center of biblical theology, if this is at the center of orthodox theology, well, what does that actually then mean in terms of these other things which are controversial when it comes to the Protestant critique? So let's take the intercession of saints as one important example. <laughs> I think the best way to understand the intercession of saints, and I've said this in other contexts, um, is by understanding it in terms of relative worship. Right? So we don't want to say that the devotion that we offer to the saints is fundamentally disconnected from the devotion that we offer to God. Because number one, that just doesn't pass the smell test. It's obvious that what do we do when we're worshiping God? We make prostrations. We kiss the icons of the incarnate word. We sense uh, places where God's presence is uh, most intensely concentrated. Well, we do the exact same things when it comes to venerating the saints. Clearly, there is an association between devotion to God and devotion to the saints. The question is the basis of that association. And that's why I prefer the phrase relative worship. If it is true that the saints are genuinely made participants in the immortal glory of God, if they are really linked into the divine presence in such a way that actually their very personhood and selfhood is inseparable from God's presence, if that has permeated who they are, well, then it is natural that the devotion that we offer to them would look like the devotion that we offer to God because they're really connected, even though they're not identified with each other. And this logic is used throughout the New Testament. So let's just look at, you know, one specific passage, uh, which is a bit of a kind of meme apologetic uh, on the Protestant end. You know, 1 Timothy uh, 2, 5, there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, what's the context of this? The context of this is Paul telling Timothy to make intercession for kings and all those who are in authority. Why does Paul invoke the mediation of Christ in specifically this context? 
Well, it's because the mediation of Christ, far from excluding Timothy's intercession, and Paul is speaking in a liturgical context here, far from excluding Timothy's intercession, actually provides the basis for that intercession. It is precisely because there is one mediator between God and man that the church participates in that mediation, because uh, the church is incorporated into that oneness which belongs to Christ. And so St. Paul says uh, in Galatians chapter 3, speaking of the family promised to Abraham, that God did not promise many seeds, but one seed who is the Messiah. And the point that he's making is about the unity of the church between Jews and Gentiles. So the unity which belongs to Christ is a unity which expands outwards and incorporates the church into it such that the church participates in an ongoing way in everything that Christ does. So uh, last of all, Romans 8 refers to the intercession of Jesus. Jesus is the one who is born witness by praying Abba Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. He makes intercession for us at the right hand of God. Well, Paul uses the very same language about the Spirit's role in the church. It is the Spirit who bears witness in our heart, and Paul uses the singular, by praying Abba, Father. And it is the church, uh, through the Spirit, who makes intercession and incorporates the groanings of creation into it, and in so doing, brings Christ's redemption to the world. So the hope of creation is the revelation of the children of God. In other words, everyone who has been adopted into God's family. So one would have to make an additional argument, and I, uh, I'm, we're going to discuss this in some detail when we get to this portion of the course. One has to make an additional argument to um, include those who have reposed or gone before us in this logic. It's an argument for the communion of saints, but this is the basic shape, I think, of the biblical logic. Theosis describes what it is like when God and man are related to each other in such a way that they can dwell together in peace. And then the sacraments, and this is the basis for all of our sacramental theology, the sacraments are these focal points for the unification of God and creation. So if this is really the central arc of the Bible, the dwelling of God with man, the unification of creation with itself, by its being unified with God, well, then the sacraments take on a specific significance in that overarching story. And when one sees the specific significance that the sacraments take on in the overarching story of the Bible, well, then I think one is enabled to see the way in which sacramental language absolutely permeates the New Testament, including in places where you wouldn't have been inclined to see it unless you're thinking in these terms. So just to give you one example, briefly, from that very passage I just talked about with the riches of God's glory, or the where Paul says, he who was rich became poor for our sakes, that we by his poverty might become rich. Well, in this context, Paul is actually speaking about the contribution of the saints in you know, financial terms to the, uh, I think it's the Jerusalem collection. But he uses Eucharistic language to describe this. He talks about a harvest being offered in thanksgiving or Eucharist to God. Well, now think liturgically about the connection that actually the offering plate, I think, you know, People feel awkward about offering plates, but I actually think it's important that they be done liturgically. Uh, the offering plate takes place in a liturgical context. You know, in my own parish, it takes place immediately um, after the consecration of the gifts into the body and blood of Christ. And that draws in all of the work that we've done throughout the week into this singular and perfect offering of Christ so that our imperfect offerings are perfected by union with his perfect offering. So that's sacramental and Eucharistic language that's going on in 2 Corinthians 9. But unless you're thinking in these terms, and unless you have, I think, an understanding of the way in which this theological logic is actually working and relating to the whole of the Bible, I think you'll miss the sacramental logic, which is really there. There we go. Sorry. Oops. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so 
basic principles in um, biblical interpretation. So, um, you know, if you've if you've heard me talk before, uh, you probably heard a lot of this before. So, um, the basic pillars of interpreting the Bible is typology and symbolism. Now, typology it comes from this Greek word tupos, which means an imprint, right? So you take let's just say like a seal with an imprint of uh, your face on it and you've pressed that seal into clay and it's going to make the likeness of your face on that clay. So typology is an imprint from above and symbolism really is the same kind of thing. So the way that we use the words typology and symbolism is typology basically captures symbolism from an horizontal or an historical perspective whereas the word symbolism is something that we perceive from a vertical perspective. So um, the earth is an imprint of the life of heaven. That's basic principle number one. And that's something that you find in the first verse of the Bible. You know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form, was void, and darkness was over the surface of the waters. Okay, so God has created this binary pair, heaven and earth, but it's only the earth which remains to be shaped and molded and brightened. And the first thing that then happens once that has been said, once you have this formless void and dark mass of water, the first thing that happens is heaven makes a descent. The spirit of God hovers over the surface of the waters countering the darkness which was hovering over the surface of the waters, and God said, let there be light. So now you have the first entrance of heavenly life into terrestrial life. So the earth, this miscontextualizes everything that then happens throughout the six creation days, because throughout the six creation days, what's going on is these things from the life of heaven, the spirit and the word, are making a descent and they are shaping and molding the terrestrial into the likeness of the celestial, into the likeness of he who is the goodness of God. So heaven is imprinted on earth. And that's the basis for the whole idea of there being pervasive symbolism in creation. So this is at the heart of the Christian concept of creation, that everything in the world does not exist with reference to itself, which is just a way of saying has no reference at all. But everything in creation exists ultimately with reference to God. That is, it points outside of itself. But it doesn't just point outside of itself in a vague way, as if, well, a tree bears witness to the fact that God exists because a tree couldn't exist without God. That might be true, but the biblical idea is more specific than that. The tree bears witness to God in specific ways. It speaks, it says specific things. There are particular qualities about God which are captured uniquely in the life of a tree. And because God is of course the source and origin of all creation, and because everything in creation exists in an ordered system, that is integrated uh, together and contextualizes itself. Because that is also true, everything in creation also signifies other things in creation. Because if everything exists in relation to God, well, they all exist in relation to the same God, and thus they all exist in relation to each other. So they signify and point outside of, uh, outside of themselves to each other. So you see this in Genesis 1 as well. Genesis 1 describes human beings as being fruitful and multiplying. Well, human beings don't have fruit. Human beings aren't sprouting pear. I mean, this sounds kind of ridiculous and pedantic, but it's actually, it's something to note in the way the text is written. Human beings are fruitful because they are being analogized to trees. And thus, the righteous man is like a tree who is planted by streams of water and bears its fruit in season so that its leaf does not wither. So this is what symbolism is all about. 
And because this is established in the order of creation, and the Bible has its reference in the real, true, created world, the symbolism that is inherent in creation and is established in Genesis 1, or in the historical creation week, that carries over and flows out into the way in which the Bible describes everything. It is because trees have this real symbolic referent that every tree you find in the Bible is going to carry through that symbolism. And that is why when Moses takes a tree and he throws it in the water and that water becomes sweet, and then you find things like Moses or God telling Moses that he's going to stand in front of a rock and Moses is to strike him with a staff, which is, of course, made out of wood. Uh, Moses is to strike him and then sweet water is going to pour out. Well, these threads are going to flow together to paint a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ which is the ultimate fulfillment of all the symbolism of the tree. Now, symbolism, from a vertical perspective, links together with typology from an historical perspective. Typology is based on the idea that what is going on in history is the drawing together of heaven and earth. So I've said that the overarching story of the Bible is God dwelling with man. It is God growing progressively closer to the creation until the two are joined at the hip. Well, if that is true, if that's the story of history, well, then later things in history should be uh, uh, imprinted on earlier things in history. So heaven or earth is an imprint of heaven, and heaven and earth come together at the end of history Thus, by that logic, things that are earlier in history are imprints of things that are later in history. And so the life of King David is an imprint of Jesus because Jesus is both the one uh, who is the archetype or model for King David, and he is the one to whom King David is leading. And so typology and symbolism are really two different perspectives on the same thing. But when we think about typology, it's really kind of typical to think of a Old Testament type and a New Testament antitype or fulfillment. But this isn't the most useful way to think about it. One problem with this is that it can seem quite arbitrary. So here's an example. This is something that I'm borrowing from James Jordan. Um, you have in the story of Rahab, um, the way in which she marks out her uh, window as that um, which will be as, as the one which will be delivered from the destruction that is about to fall on Jericho. The way that she marks out her dwelling place as safe is by throwing a scarlet thread out of the window. Now, Christians have looked at that and they've said, well, this is an anticipation of Jesus whose blood redeems us from destruction. And that's true. But the question is, is this just an intuition or something that we vaguely gesture at, or does it have a more um, organic or systematic basis? Well, it does. And the way to see that is by looking at typology in a cumulative way. Um, so the story of Rahab is actually taking place in the context of a series of event, events which recapitulates the story of Israel's exodus from Egypt. So Moses crosses the Red Sea uh, by splitting the sea. Well, the same thing happens in the book of Joshua. Joshua splits the Jordan River and Israel passes through the miraculously divided uh, Jordan River. Uh, this is the context. Uh, if you look at just the narrative shape of this section of Joshua and that section of Exodus, the narrative of Exodus is simply told in reverse order. So in Joshua, the splitting of the sea happens first and not last. Um, and then when you look at the story of Rahab's scarlet thread in light of that, you find, well, this actually corresponds to the blood being put on the doorposts in Passover. And so these things relate to each other, and that builds forward into the coming of Christ. So you see these threads, by the time they reach Christ, they are already tied together and interrelated with other threads. So look at an obvious example, Genesis 12. 
in the book of Exodus. So this is what Genesis 12 tells us about Abraham. It says, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. Uh, and then Pharaoh takes Abram's wife, and this is what it says. The Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me she was your wife? So on and so forth. And then um, Pharaoh gives him his wife gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that she had. Now, when Abram leaves, Abram takes with him much of the wealth of Egypt, uh, because for Sarai's sake, it says, Pharaoh dealt well with Abram. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, all that he had, and lot with him into the ne Negev, now, Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold. And then he goes to a place where he built an altar and he calls in the name of the Lord. So this is just the story of the Exodus in miniature. Israel goes down into Egypt because of a famine. When Israel goes down into Egypt, they are initially given a place of wealth and exaltation. Pharaoh persecutes Israel, takes things which aren't his to take. Ultimately, God sends plagues on Egypt. Because of those plagues, uh, Israel leaves Egypt, and then they go and they build the tabernacle and they offer sacrifice to God. Well, that's just the story that we've read here. And there's many other exoduses that we read about in the book of Genesis. Um, the story of Jacob, the story of Moses. These stories are actually written blow by blow in parallel. I have an article on this where I've talked about this, and I want to go through all of them here. But one interesting thing that you find is that when you line up the stories next to each other, the story of Israel's war with the Amalekites in Exodus chapter 17, that's the people whom Israel meets as they're leaving Egypt and they, have, they fight a battle with them. Um, Israel's battle with the Amalekites under Moses's leadership corresponds to Jacob's meeting with Esau. Now, when you look at the genealogy of the Amalekites and Esau and the Edomites, you find that uh, Esau made a quite substantial genetic contribution to the Amalekites. And so there's a correspondence here. But you also find, by looking at the correspondence, that while the Amalekites are killed, Esau meets Jacob as a converted man. And you find there that there is a correspondence between death and conversion. And that provides a lot of actually the basis for the language that we use about baptism, being a death with Christ and things like that. Jacob anticipates Moses. Moses anticipates King David. Moses is described in military terms. He leads Israel in battle. His, um, his contest with Pharaoh is described in military terms. And ultimately, when Moses despoils the Egyptians and they leave Egypt and they take much of the wealth of Egypt with them, well, that wealth is then used to construct the tabernacle. Well, King David is like Moses. King David, his principal battles are with the Philistines. And if you know Genesis chapter 10, which describes the genealogy of the originally divided nations of the world, Genesis chapter 10 tells us that the Philistines are most closely related with the Egyptians. And you find Philistines described near the territory of Egypt throughout the Hebrew Bible, because I think contrary to the um, popular perception that these are fundamentally Greeks, uh, scripture seems to describe them as most closely associated with Egypt. Now, King David, he defeats the Philistines, just as Moses did the Egyptians, and that brings him lots of wealth. And that wealth is actually what then goes to build the temple in the days of his son, um, Solomon. And of course, David anticipates Jesus. But when David anticipates Jesus as the son and heir of David, he does so as someone who has already fulfilled Moses, who fulfills Jacob, who in many, way, many ways fulfills the story of Abel. And you look at those threads and you connect them all together. Well, that gives you a more organic or beautiful or complicated in a good way basis for understanding why Jesus is the fulfillment of the martyrdom of Abel. Jesus is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. Um, David crushed the head of Goliath, who as a Nephilim is actually in certain ways descended from the serpent. 
uh, and Goliath is also described as wearing armor, which is said to be scaled, scaled like snake armor. David's battle with Goliath corresponds in the structure of Samuel with Saul's battle after he was anointed king with another enemy of the Israelites. And that king's name is actually Nahash or serpent. So there's all sorts of ways in which we can see typology as something more sophisticated and subtle and rich and beautiful than just an Old Testament story being uh, resembled by a New Testament fulfillment. And I want to emphasize here that when we talk about typology, this isn't just aesthetic window dressing. What typology does is it gives us the language we need to really cash out what it means to describe the redemptive accomplishment of Jesus. When we understand typology and we look at these characters in relation to each other, we see the significance of the lives of each of these characters in a different light than we would have seen before. So I've already given you the example of when you, when you realize that Amalek and Esau correspond to each other, well, that typological relationship gives you the language you need to understand why it is that redemption is described as a kind of death. It gives you the language you need to understand why military language is so often associated with or just transformed into liturgical language. What do you do when you're fighting a war? You use a sword, you use fire. What do you do in the temple? You use knives and you use fire. And God's army is described as a liturgical army. That's why it's not arbitrary to describe Christ conquering the world by baptizing it. It's more than a cute image. This work that Jesus carries out is the stitching together of everything in heaven and on earth. And the stitching together of everything in heaven and on earth means that everything is comprehensively interrelated with everything else and the way you see that on the historical plane is typology. And finally, there is the kind of textual analogy to typology, this is intertextuality. Intertextuality means basically the use of one text, an earlier text by a later text. Um, and intertextuality gives us a concrete and more objective way of seeing how certain biblical themes are developed and grown uh, throughout the structure of the Bible as a whole. So um, an example of intertextuality uh, would simply be um, something like what you find in Isaiah. Isaiah describes the suffering servant as being stricken for the transgressions of my people. In the same context, it describes the suffering servant as the one through whom God's promise to King David is fulfilled. That tells you that this is a messianic prophecy. Well, stricken for the transgressions of my people. Well, this phrase, along with a number of other phrases in Isaiah 53, actually draws on the very language of the Davidic covenant, where God says about David's son, when he transgresses, when he sins, uh, I will strike him with stripes. Um, and many of these same words are used in Isaiah 53. People ask how the Davidic covenant can be fulfilled in Jesus when, in fact, he is pure of sin. Well, it's interesting that the same kind of paradox is there in Isaiah, and Isaiah shows us a way to reason. So that's another important pillar in um, just following through a kind of systematic study of the Bible. Glorification and redemption. <coughs> Pardon me. So Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, I think, gives us a kind of thumbnail sketch of what the Bible is all about. In him, we have redemption through his blood, forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Elsewhere in Ephesians, Paul says about the work of Christ, that this was according to the eternal purpose that he has now realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The eternal purpose, which is in Christ from before the foundation of the world, 
is the unification of all things in him. That's why Paul describes in Colossians uh, 2, the fullness of deity dwelling bodily in Christ. And then in Ephesians, which is really a partner letter with Colossians, Ephesians, that same phrase is used of us, so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. It's because all the fullness of God dwells in him that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. This is the principal or overarching story arc that we find in scripture. It is God's intent to get closer and closer and closer to his creation in and through mankind. So we see this, this series of binaries in Genesis chapter one. First binary is heaven and earth. Last binary is male and female. And in the, um, in the, in the structure of, of Genesis and in the structure of the whole Bible, mankind is seen as the uh, mediating point between heaven and earth. So one way to see this in Genesis one, you just look at the six or the, uh, the creation days as a, um, a chiasm, which means A, B, C, B, A. So A corresponds to A, B corresponds to B, C is the center. So just look at the seven creation days as a chiasm. Mankind is linked with the firmament, which is consistently represented in the scripture as the mediating point. It is not only a place which or a thing which separates God from creation, but it is also that which interrelates them. It's the point of transition. Well, human beings are the mediation point between heaven and earth. Human beings are, as Genesis 2 will say, the generations of or the offspring of heaven and earth. And it is in human beings that these two sections of reality are drawn into each other. You can also see this just in the uh, language that is used of the tabernacle and temple. Language that is used of the tabernacle and temple is, especially the temple, is corporeal or bodily language. The temple has ribs and legs and a heart and a head and things like this. And so you see in the book of Daniel, the idealized, glorified human being is actually described as being made up of all of those metals which make up the temple. Human beings are the focal point of creation into whom all creation is drawn so that all creation will be glorified. This is the principal story arc of scripture. When God says to Adam that he is to exercise dominion and subdue or conquer the world, this is a mandate to exercise and do the kinds of things that God has been doing throughout the six creation days. In context, to say that man is the image of God is to say that man is to do the things that God has been doing. He's to mold and shape and separate and put things together and give names, which is why in Genesis 2, Adam is going to give names to things that were not named in Genesis chapter 1. And we see that man is described as having been created in the image and likeness of God. So it's, a, it's an old tradition. Um, going back at least to Irenaeus, that these two things are subtly distinct from each other. We are corporately as the human family, the image of God. We are meant to grow into his likeness. And I think when you look at the, um, at the Hebrew words here, the distinction between these two concepts can be found in the prepositions that are used in relation to the word image and in relation to the word likeness. When you look at the preposition that is used with the word likeness here, and you just look at the way that it's used um, in conjunction with human beings throughout the rest of the Bible, I think it consistently captures this concept of that which human beings are meant to grow into in the process of glorification. Now, of course, man is exiled from the Garden of Eden, um, and that necessitates redemption. That necessitates there being a purchasing back of human beings from destruction. But I would suggest that that is the principal subplot in the Bible, not the main plot. The main plot is God's coming to dwell with man. The subplot is the overcoming of the obstacle to the realization of that original purpose. So you read letter to the Hebrews. Letter to the Hebrews 
emphasizes the necessity of atonement in order that mankind might be received into glory. And Paul repeatedly refers to this passage from Psalm 8, which says that man was made for a little while lower than the angels, but in Christ is crowned with glory and with honor. That is, mankind is now exalted to have authority over everything in creation, everything in heaven and earth, so angels as well as animals. So the principal narrative arc in scripture is the glorification of mankind into the likeness of God, into communion with and union with God, in order that he might transmit that life to the entirety of the world. So this uh, overarching, this big story gets miniaturized in the first little story in the Bible, which is the story of creation to the flood. Well, what Noah does is he takes trees and he looks at the kind of divine archetype for the ark, which God reveals to him. God gives him an exact blueprint for the ark. So Noah looks at that blueprint and he models it out exactly. He takes trees and he puts them together in a new way so that he makes a perfect representation of what he saw in heaven. And he could see into heaven because he walked with God. Well, then Noah takes all the animals and he puts them in this environment that he has made. And then the flood comes and Noah is exalted. Noah is lifted up by the waters of the flood. The same waters that destroyed the rest of the world exalt Noah. He goes up to the top of the holy mountain and there God gives him a new authority. God gives him authority over everything. He says, as I gave you the green plants, so now I give you everything. So then the story which follows out from that is a story about Noah's clothing, because clothing signifies authority. In the book. This is a miniaturized thumbnail sketch of the overall narrative, which is about the exaltation of human beings in the person of Christ. So some major threads that we see when we work through the Bible. First of all, I think the centrality of naming in connection with the idea of liturgy. Well, Genesis 1 is, in certain ways, a liturgical text. It is about the development and building of a temple in which God is going to dwell. And what God does throughout Genesis 1 is he's speaking to the world. He's giving it names. But as he speaks to the world, the world begins to have the capacity to speak back. God speaks with increasing intimacy. He first announces things, causes them simply to be. Then he speaks to the earth, and the earth begins to respond. Then he personally gives a command to the beasts, calling them to be fruitful and multiply. And when he addresses human beings, it uses a preposition which was not used for the same command given to the animals, indicating that human beings alone among all of these creatures has the capacity to address God in response. And so that is why human beings are then seen giving things names, why human beings are then seen in conversation with God, and then why in Genesis uh, um, 3 and in Genesis 4, we see the major crisis points are when God engages human beings in this conversation and they do not respond in a truthful way. Then at the end of Genesis 4, when Seth replaces Abel, it says at that time, man began to call upon the name of the Lord. That phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, is used throughout the Bible in a liturgical setting. You see it used in the New Testament in connection with baptism. In our own divine liturgy, we sing psalms about calling on the name of the Lord as Eucharistic hymns. Uh, in, in Genesis 12, Abram is said to call on the name of the Lord when he builds an altar. Well then you see this same theme appearing in the construction of the Tower of Babel or Babylon. The Tower of Babel, uh, mankind wants to create a great name for ourselves. The enemy of the Babel project is Shem. Shem is the righteous son of Noah, whose ultimate heir is Abraham. Shem's name means name. The word Shem means name. And the Tower of Babel is a liturgical 
object. It's a liturgical building. It is meant to be a ladder to heaven. Um, they build a tower and a city. The tower is the temple on which they are intending to base their great name. Then when Israel builds a sanctuary, God says, this is the place where I will make my name to dwell. So this is all liturgical in its character. We see the theme of things being named or God making his name to dwell somewhere or calling on the name of the Lord. These things happen most acutely in a liturgical sacral setting. And that gives you some context for understanding, I think, the significance of baptism in the New Testament. We're baptized into the name of Jesus, the Messiah. When Paul is baptized, said Ananias says to him in Acts 22, why do you wait? Rise and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You also see the centrality of the theme of memory happening in liturgical contexts. Jesus in the words of institutions is do this as my memorial or in memory of me. There are various ways of translating that. Well, this is linked with the Paschal offering that we see in the Old Testament, Passover. This is called a memorial offering. It's also linked with the tribute offering, often translated as the grain offering, in Leviticus chapter 2. This is actually an offering of bread. It gets combined with wine later in Israel's history when they enter into the promised land. The tribute offering is called an offering of memorial. And this is because this is the way in which Israel is linked back with their own past history. The Paschal offering is a memorial offering because it is a way of entering into the reality of the Exodus, no matter where you are. The tribute offering is a kind of commemoration of the exodus you are recapitulating reenacting the passover once you've placed yourself outside of the covenant by sin you go through a ritual whereby you atone for that and then you recap all of those events that have already happened and when you present this tribute to god it is not just a memorial on your part but it is a way of god remembering you so you speak god's name he speaks your name. And all of this is happening liturgically. Access to the divine presence. So this is the major narrative arc of the whole Bible, major narrative arc of Genesis and Exodus. Genesis, man is expelled from the divine presence. The end of Exodus, uh, you have the divine presence returning to creation. Well, Exodus 40 ends with this statement that the glory of God fills the tabernacle so that nobody can enter it. Well, that's a major problem. And so in the literary patterning of the Pentateuch, that problem gets answered in Leviticus 1, which is about a way of ascending into the divine presence. Mm -hmm. Moses's face is a major thread in the book of Exodus. Mm -hmm. When Moses meets God for the first time in the burning bush, and that fire in the burning bush is God's glory, it says Moses turned away his face because he could not bear to look at God. The story of Moses' transformation in the book of Exodus is the story of how he comes to be able to look at God. And very significantly, when Moses turns to God, his face is transfigured, and he becomes irradiated with divine glory. So this text is straightforwardly about theosis divinization. You can see this in a myriad of ways. Um, one way is that when God descends on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, the people of Israel are afraid. They draw back. Well, exactly the same thing happens when Moses, having seen God and having his face transfigured by divine light, Moses descends the holy mountain and Israel reacts to him in precisely the way that they had reacted to God's descent on the holy mountain. So the book of Exodus is telling us very straightforwardly that what has happened here to Moses is an instance of divinization. And in fact, Moses's body and the things that are said about Moses link him to the tabernacle so that the human being is presented as the idealized dwelling place for God's glory, which is ultimately realized in light radiating 
from their face. That is what it means for God to dwell with man, because this is what it, Moses is the only one who can actually enter straight into the divine presence, which Israel can't do. Major thread, God draws progressively nearer to mankind. So when God speaks, the things that he does to the people of Israel change them. When God addresses Israel in the period of the judges, he is talking to a people who worship crude idols. They worship other gods outright. But what happens to them during the period of the judges actually alters and changes them. They are different people by the time you get to the period of the kings. And so in the period of the kings, they're not worshiping idols outright. They're generally just worshiping the true God in false ways on high places. And they have a new sanctuary, a new sanctuary which allows for a more intimate access to the divine presence. The transition from the tabernacle to then the tabernacle of David and then ultimately to the temple is the story of God's drawing near to the creation. Sorry, did someone say something? Okay, sorry. Um, almost done, then I'll open to discussion. Um, and then finally, you have the incarnation of the word. God has been speaking to Israel throughout the Old Testament. And as God speaks, and by that speech, he has been drawing nearer and nearer. So ultimately, that speech becomes a human being in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And I think you're, you see here kind of a, a conceptual mold for why it makes so much sense that in our tradition, the Virgin Mary grows up in the shadow of the temple. The Virgin Mary is everywhere and always associated with the temple because God has been throughout the Old Testament preparing a body for himself. His shaping of Israel creates the people through whom he might actually become a human being. And that is summed up and finally realized in the person of the Virgin Mary, who personally provides him his being. So you get in biblical histories, four major phases. Um, you have the period of Moses to, uh, to the period of the kings. Uh, you have the period of the kings down to the period of the exile. And you have the period of the exile down to the coming of Christ and then the coming of Christ onwards. And you see these four phases and the associated themes linked up with each of the four Gospels. Matthew's Gospel presents Jesus principally as new Moses. Mark is major theme is Jesus as warrior king, uh, like David. Luke presents him as the traveling prophet who goes from place to place and bears witness uh, to Jew and Gentile alike. And finally, John's gospel has as its principal focus the actual incarnation of the word self and sums up everything which has come before and then points the way to the eschatological consummation of all of that in the apocalypse. So that's what I have for you today. Um, I want let me just stop the screen share and... Um, if anyone has any comments or questions, um, just hit the hand raise button. Yeah, Ayush. Yeah, this is a more general question. So a lot of what you were talking about at the beginning um, about the world as God's sanctuary and about typology. I see that in like a lot of Protestant writers as well, right? Like in, in, in Jim Jordan, for example, he'll call the world God's house. So I guess my question is, is if some Protestant writers like Jordan and Orthodox people can start from that same mindset on how to approach scripture, that really scripture is this ultimate story about how God comes to dwell with his people. How do we end up diverging so far um, from each other at the end of our theology? If we're starting with the same I guess the same presuppositions about it. Well, I think with uh, the writers who you mentioned in particular, um, you can see over their kind of theological careers that they themselves begin to diverge more and more from at least emphasizing the, the historic Protestant distinctives. So, uh, for example, Jordan would openly speak about, I mean, Jordan actually um, wrote a review in an academic journal um, of a translation of Gregory Palamas's 150 chapters and actually <laughs> explicitly call himself near the end of his career a Palamite. Um, uh, and uh, Jordan will speak 
uh, openly and straightforwardly about theosis and divinization. And I think you find that both he and Lightheart, um, both he and Lightheart uh, come to neglect more and more um, the traditional kind of interpretation of justification as an imputation or something like that. Uh, and it's also important to, to recognize that for Jordan, um, uh, at the beginning of his theological career, he was pretty deeply influenced by Orthodox uh, liturgical theology. So they're, they're Protestants, but they're kind of weird Protestants. Um, but also I think that there is just a, um, a reality that when a Protestant um, confessionally uh, studies and really cares about the Bible, um, over time, that's going to shape them in, in such a way that they're going to emphasize very strongly the things that align with what we would teach. Um, so I'm I'm glad that individual Protestants, by studying the Bible, become um, more orthodox. But I don't think that um, the actual divergences were reasoned forward from those kinds of premises. Cool. Thanks. Micah. Yeah, so I had a question about the veneration of icons. Um, one of my friends proposed an opposition to the veneration of icons by saying that the bronze serpent was a type of Christ and yet offering of incense to it was considered illicit. Um, what would be a good response to that from an Orthodox point of view? I think in the, in the days of King Hezekiah, the bronze serpent um, had been become worshipped as just an outright idol. And I think that the thing to understand about the bronze serpent um, is that the lifting up of the bronze serpent is a representation of Christ's conquest of the devil, right? Um, so the reason that the serpent is being lifted up here is that Christ in being crucified is taking on to himself the attack of the devil and thus is actually defeating the devil by the very means that the devil meant to defeat him. So in a sense, it's a it's an icon of Christ, but the way in which that incense was being offered to the bronze serpent, uh, I think was just outright idolatrous. And I think we should say, you know, there is such a thing as just folk religiosity that just transitions into idolatry. Um, and that's something that you find in Orthodox Catholic and, you know, Protestant places. Uh, there is a lot of folk religion, which was outright occult and idolatrous in upstate New York in the early 19th century, just like there is in, uh, you know, rural regions of Eastern Europe and things like that. Um, but I think we have to assess our case for the veneration of iconography, um, not based on whether that kind of stuff happens, but what actually does the church present as legitimate veneration of icons? I'll say more about that. We have a there's a, I think it might be the second to last um, in this course on the veneration of icons. So I'll say more about that at that point. Okay, thank you. When they named the, uh, when they made the association between the bronze serpent and another deity, could you say that they were giving absolute worship to it instead of relative worship? Well, I mean, I think that the other deities that they were, worshiping are ones that shouldn't be given absolute or relative worship. Um, I don't know that, that we are really have the data to distinguish between those two categories in this case, but it's kind of like, um, you know, with Baalism, because I think the what's going on in the bronze serpent um, is this is a defeat of Baalism and Baal is the liturgical embodiment of the devil um, in the Old Testament. Um, so whatever kind of honor is being given to a serpent figure at this point, I think is illegitimate. Um, so was that Caleb who said that or Caleb, did you? Oh, no, no. I had another question afterwards. Okay. If that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah cool. Um, I have a cold. Sorry if I destroy your ears with my coughing. But um, yeah, just kind of like two questions. So I'm coming from an evangelical Protestant background and the evangelical church that I currently attend, there's maybe like a handful of people who go very deep within the theology, but I would say the, the vast majority, and um, I might be safe in saying this, but like the vast majority of low church evangelical Protestants sort of are just very pragmatic 
and they just look at the Bible very practically. And so, um, you know, from someone who's wanting to enjoy and eventually convert to orthodoxy, how could I get people who I'm surrounded by to get a little bit more excited about maybe the more symbolic and typological interpretations of scripture rather than, you know, what does it say in the Greek? And then that's all I care about kind of thing. Um, I guess one example I could see is like what a, a lot of evangelical Protestants really like is the story of like Moses striking the, the rock and water pours out. And uh, God tells him to just speak to the rock after that, but then he strikes it again. And you can see how much God cares about like kind of that typological um, aspect of the, the image of Christ that Paul describes later on. And so I can see how like maybe you could get someone who's from an evangelical background more excited on that. But I'm wondering like, what are, what would you say to someone when you're conversing with them who just have like a very pragmatic view of the scriptures to get them excited about something like this? Well, I think it depends on, it's hard to, you know, get someone to be excited about some, something. Um, I think what I would, a question that's easier to address along those lines is how would you argue for the legitimacy of those kinds of interpretations? Because there's some people who just aren't used to reading scripture in that way. And with those folks, I think the way to at least try to get them to read scripture in that way is just to do it with them, um, just to suggest this or that uh, interpretation um, or something like that, and maybe they'll roll with it. Um, or you could read, you know, a book along those lines together. Lighthearts, you know, House Friend, My Name is really kind of safe book to read along those lines. Um, and, uh, but for someone who actually argues that those kinds of interpretive patterns are illegitimate, um, then I think you can say something more specific because you do find in certain evangelical circles, and this is a this is a trend which goes back to the reforms. Um, this, is, this is, I think, actually endemic to classical Protestantism. Um, to the extent that Protestants have departed from this, they're departing from the reformers. Uh, people will say things like, um, a type is only a type if it is explicitly stated as such in the New Testament. Now, I don't think the reformers ever put it that starkly, but this kind of skepticism for typological reading definitely goes back to the Reformation. Um, and the problem with this is that you know, when you look at certain things that the New Testament authors expected their audience to assume, it's completely contrary to that kind of principle. So for example, uh, Jesus, when he's speaking to his disciples uh, after the two feedings, he says, uh, when I fed the 5,000, how many baskets were left over? And they say 12. And when I fed the 4,000, how many baskets were left over? And they say seven. And then he says, how is it that you don't understand? So Jesus expected the disciples, just knowing what they already knew, to be able to know, number one, that there was symbolic significance to the number of baskets of leftover bread after these two respective feedings. And number two, to have the tools to actually interpret what that significance actually was. Or the same thing when St. Paul in 1 Corinthians quotes casually this passage in Deuteronomy, you shall not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, in order to argue for the necessity of paying the Christian minister. Now, there is this very specific and actually very tight logic to the use of that quotation, but Paul simply expects his audience to understand or follow that logic. And so I think if we're committed to thinking with the apostles, to not merely you know digesting propositional statements that are found therein but acquiring the mind of the apostles as the mind of christ well then we have to read scripture along those same lines and with those same patterns uh, because that's the way that the bible reads itself and so the best guide to reading the bible in certain ways is the bible itself and that, that's how scripture interprets itself i think awesome thanks man mm -hmm. Uh, Yasha. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, just a, a comment and then a question. A uh, comment on somebody asked about the, the James Jordan, Peter Lightheart, you know, starting with common principles of interpretation. Um, I come from a, a very confessional Presbyterian background. And uh, in those circles, just um, maybe the, the questioner wasn't aware, they're kind of in sort of the mainstream reformed circles there, uh, they encourage people not to listen to James Jordan, and Peter Lightheart, because they kind of stray from the uh, sort of classic 
uh, you know, Protestant uh, conceptions and understanding of scripture. So um, there's sort of an inconsistency with them, right? I think they kind of, uh, and I know a lot of people that, you know, followed the work of Theophilus Institute, and then they, they do end up in orthodoxy. Um, uh, just if they see the consistency um, with the way they're reading scripture. So can I, uh, can I add something to that? Yeah. Yeah. I actually was at a, a, a Theophilus conference about a year ago. I met Peter Lightheart there. I met a lot of the people there and they're really, I mean, there was one other Orthodox gentleman there who I, um, who I knew online beforehand. Um, and I can say that definitely among the people there, um, there was a lot of kind of friendliness and openness to, you know, Orthodox theology and stuff. I think Jordan himself is has kind of compensated for the fact that so many of his students have become Orthodox by saying some really nasty things about us. But, you know, in the broader kind of Theopolitan crowd, there's a lot of recognition that there's um, there's a lot that we really that we really do share among us. And I also know that they're the books because they wrote their own like liturgy books. And a lot of the stuff that's in their liturgy books I, is taken from the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, um, uh, word for word. I think actually specifically from the Antiochian translation of that liturgy, because I'm reading through it, I can see it's the, the same thing. So um, yeah, they, they, they are definitely looked on as kind of um, traitors to the cause by a bunch of reform gentlemen anyway sorry um yeah definitely no that's uh that's uh that's good um i just i was just curious uh, since you uh um i don't know many orthodox into sort of biblical studies are you uh, familiar with gk beale yeah uh gk beale's work actually has been a pretty big influence on me as well i think okay. great stuff i was just gonna ask do you recommend his uh his works yeah yeah i mean it um so I think his uh, work on the New Testament interpretation of the Old Testament in particular is really, really, really useful. Um, he's got a very good sense for intertextuality, um, for the way, you know, the way the texts quote each other, um, which is very insightful. And also he's got that book um, on the temple um, in biblical theology, which very much dovetails with the kinds of things that I've argued. Um, there's an interesting piece uh, paper in um, a fest shrift that was done for James Jordan several years ago, which kind of compares and contrasts Beale and Jordan's approach to typology and symbolism. And I think the point that they that the author made, I forget who wrote the paper, was really interesting in that Beale kind of had all the stuff about the temple and recognized its significance in relating the testaments to each other. Um, but ultimately, when it came down then to practically applying that, he wanted to avoid any kind of real liturgical patterning. Whereas Jordan saw the significance of the temple and liturgy to biblical theology as providing a real pattern for Christian liturgy, um, which in certain ways, uh, this is me speaking, not that not that article, uh, in certain ways dovetails with, with things that, that we would say. But um, in response directly to the question, I do think that his work in general is, is very, very useful. Okay, thank you so much. Aish. Hey, thanks. Oh, also, uh, Yasha, on the point you just made, that's kind of funny that you bring that up about Jim Jordan. Uh, the reason I asked that question is because my girlfriend is actually uh, in one of in uh, the PCA, so she's part of the same kind of a tradition, I guess, you come from. And uh, I brought Jim Jordan up to one of the random guys there, and he goes, oh, he should just probably become a Catholic or something at this point. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've come across yeah. that kind of <laughs> I've come across that kind of mindset before for the first time now, just this past weekend. Uh, Kimbe, my question is a little bit more of a practical nature. So um, I tend to do a lot of, like, uh, Bible reading from secondary sources, just because I find the Bible on its own pretty difficult to get into. That's why I bring up Jim Jordan. So what would you recommend for just getting into the Bible on its own terms, on its own ground first? Should I just dive in and try and chronologically read from Genesis to Revelation all the way through? Should I, I don't know, start with a certain set of books that would be, I guess, like the right place to start? Where, where would you start to, to really get into the Bible on its own? I would. So honestly, if you have the time, if you have the time, it is possible to do this. Uh, I would recommend going through the whole Bible in a month. You have to like take like three hours a day uh, and do it. But if you don't have the time, which you probably don't, uh, I would say try try doing it in three months. Uh, do it quickly and then go, I would say you can um, read Old Testament, New Testament at the same time and read the New Testament multiple times in that period. 
Um, I, I think doing it in a compressed time scale, in contrast, doing it over a year is your best bet because you're more likely to see the interconnections among things than you would be if you were just going bit by bit, day by day. Um, so when I when I first was really diving into the Bible, I did it in a pretty short time scale. And I say it was really useful. And it was just kind of an experience to have this kind of whirlwind um, tour of you know God's God's revelation. And you just got a sense of its inner unity in addition to seeing specific ways that the things connected with, with each other. Okay, cool. So maybe if I just did something like read the Old Testament cover to cover in the morning and then in the evening did something like read the New Testament cover to cover and just see where the overlap is. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Nectarius. Yes, I try. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is this um, quote um, in the Fathers that um, when uh, concerning uh, like um, reading scriptures or thinking about scriptures and the news, right? So when um, your news is not like uh, cleaned up from passions, when you read scripture, it can become demonic, right? I think it's um, Saint Maximus the Confessor says that. And this is what I oftentimes, uh, I would see what, which makes se sense to me. And I see with Protestants as well as, I mean, it's everybody's problem, right? That when you read something, um, it has to pass through your uh, through this barrier of your news, and you then start to interpret like you like, right? Or what what your passions kind of uh, how to say it in English? Um, they just uh, disturb like the the picture. Um, just to use an allegory, uh, they just disturb the picture of what you actually um, reading or seeing. And um, yeah. Um, how i mean um how how do you deal with that or how do you think about this specific uh, point yeah um so i think I, I should have said this when i asked you should always pray before reading scripture you say a short prayer illumine our hearts a master loves mankind or something along those lines um you know, the, the fathers, they enjoin us to read scripture consistently and regularly, but scripture in a sense can be like what Jesus says about his parables in that they open the eyes of those who have eyes to see, but they blind those who are just committed to, you know, um, getting what they want out of them. And I think that's one reason why the biblical academy knows less about scripture, you know, in general, the specific kind of progressive liberal sector of it. They know less about it than when they started. They invent crazy things like the uh, documentary hypothesis or whatnot. Um, so you have to approach it, uh, number one, with prayer, and number two, with a disposition of belief, not unbelief, um, of believing what God actually is communicating um, to us. Uh, and then, you know, read it in conjunction with regular and consistent church going and confession and repentance and things like that mm -hmm. um i think you know that's just the that's all we can really do um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah i mean that's concerning oneself but when you're for example in discussions with others um do you sense or would you say there's like a, a line when you see that the other person is like i don't know very passionate uh, in in the bad sense that it actually doesn't make sense to really discuss or even show scripture because the person it would rather do damage to them than be of of benefit. Yeah, that I, I guess there are there are cases where that's definitely true, but um, individual people are so complicated it's hard for me to give a specific mm -hmm. answer to that in general. I mean, you know, with uh, you know, people like uh, liberal Old Testament academics, you know, I kind of just have come to the point where I mostly just ignore what they say. I don't really feel like engaging with them. We don't really have very much to say to each other. And I think what they say is so ludicrous that it's um, it's, it's not even worth engaging with on a one-on-one -on -one level. But I can say, you know, it's a very spiritually 
toxic environment, you know, biblical studies at some place like Harvard. Um, it's just uh, suffocating from from what people have experienced. So, but yeah, it's hard to give a general answer to, to that question because everyone's case is going to be so different. Okay, thank you. Zach. Zach. Zach, it says you're unmuted, but I don't uh, hear anything you're saying. Uh, yeah, well, Zach is connecting. Josh, do you want to go? <laughs> Whoever goes first is fine. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, cool. Sorry, I was just messaging in the in the chat before. Um, how would you assess when like a, one of the typological claims goes too far? Um, because I think like from one of the pe people that were mentioning before, like coming from the you know prop background, it um, a lot of those a lot of those like poetic. I don't know how you describe it, but but symbolic and poetic claims can just be like, oh, that's nice, <laughs> and not have an actual application, um, because they either either they don't, I guess, understand what the significance is of it. And I think you kind of answered that, but going the other way, like there's a lot of um, you could be like a conspiracy theorist and see how everything's connected, and um, people obviously can go too far with that. So how do we or, or how would you kind of um, be able to rein that in, or, or really be, have a have a high confidence in those uh, levels of connection? Well, I would say number one, our, our principal rule is just uh, is going to be the tradition, which is the canon in the broader sense. So that's our first rule. Um, but number two, I think that when it comes to things like this, um, it's kind of a matter of you know you get better with practice. Um, and that's because the more you study the Bible, the more you become familiar with the specific content that it has. And the more a specific typological or symbolic association can be tested uh, in the context of a larger um, body of, of textual data. So a, a typological claim or a statement that this text is related to this concept in a particular way, the you can have a higher confidence in that if it's connected to more passages than just one, right? So this is like the example of Rahab's scarlet thread that I mentioned earlier. Part of the reason that we can have confidence that it really is an anticipation of Christ is because we can see based on the structure of the text and the words that are used, that it has this connection with passage. And we also know explicitly from the New Testament, but also in many other ways, that the death of Christ is connected with passage. And so because we have those connections already in place, it's you can establish the legitimacy of the link between Rahab's scarlet thread and the blood of Christ in multiple um, interdependent ways. Um, and that really provides kind of a control or a grounding. Now, I don't think that there's anything especially dangerous or horrible about a typological connection, which is theologically orthodox, but not, might not be in the text. So I don't think we should be overcautious about those kinds of things. I think we should be, keep an open mind when we see something which might be, or hear something from someone which might be possible, but we don't necessarily see how it works. Um, there've been plenty of cases actually. And when I've heard someone make kind of an association, I was kind of like, I don't really see that, but I put it on the shelf. You know, I don't want to dismiss it out of hand. And then later as I'm reading through the Bible, I thought, oh wait, that does make sense. There's A, B, C, D, and E, and it all connects and it actually makes really good sense of a bunch of different things. Um, so it's a matter of having a wider range <coughs> range of biblical data, quote unquote, on hand, keeping an open mind um, and uh, maintaining one's fidelity to the tradition as the normative yardstick by which our interpretation of scripture um, can be measured. Awesome. Thank you. Zach. Uh, Zach, I still don't hear you. Are you able to put your question in the uh, chat? Yeah. 
Oh, while he's typing, if anyone else has anything, um, you can raise your hand as well. Thanks, Micah. I'll see you uh, on Tuesday. I can. Uh, I do have a um, one of the uh, a class sessions just going to be specifically on that. So if it's just a general question, I might hold off until I can make the argument more systematically. So for those, um, I'm not sure if the recording shows up. Um, uh, or the chat will show for those who are watching by recording, but the question was about um, saying more about intercession of saints and relative worship and things like that. Nectarius, yeah, I, um, so Nectarius, please don't forget you wanna do a Calvinist class. So yeah, I think um, the next class I'm going to offer because I'm really liking the way that this one is going, it's either going to be on making the argument that Jesus is the Messiah, or it's going to be specifically on predestination. So I'm going to offer both of those at some point, but I'm not sure which one I want to do first. Um, so does anyone have anything else? Uh, Please keep taking my money and offering these classes. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, if uh, no one has anything else, then uh, I will, uh, God willing, see you all on Tuesday. I think the topic for Tuesday is going to be justification. So there are going to be two classes on justification. Um, and uh, as mentioned, I will send you guys the Dropbox link with the recording of this class and the last one uh, tomorrow evening. So uh, thanks so much. Uh, please keep uh, myself and my fiance Magdalena in your prayers and have me liturgically uh, commemorated. And uh, I will see you then. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, man. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.